Hello again, this is Jonathan at the Piano Lesson. Hope you guys are doing well, having a great summer. And uh, today is a bit unscripted, but I'm going to share with you hopefully a few nuggets of wisdom or not, whatever um, comes to my mind. Um, I, I, I kind of wanted to continue with this idea about artificial intelligence and language. Um, you know, music is a language. And music is not so much about the notes. It's about the space in between the notes, the interaction of the notes. The Sometimes I've heard it referred to as dark matter, if you want to call it that. But the interaction of the notes. Um, likewise, there's a professor at Cornell that I was um, uh, reading an article of, of his, and he was discussing language as improvisation, which I found to be very interesting. And as far as I could tell, his, impro his definition of improvisation was merely this interaction between two people, this dialogue. And uh, they were, he was... Uh, talking in uh, reference to AI and how AI really could never do, would never be capable of doing, at least not now, um, <clears throat> what one needs to be capable of doing to create language, which is imp improvisation and interaction and, and, and a dialogue. I, I, I liken it to really just playing a ball game, you know, just having a catch with two people or something like that. Um, now, he says that it's it's uh, that AI really, rather than a dialogue, it has a monologue. But I would even say that that's not even quite true because when we engage in a monologue, when we have a monologue like I'm doing right now, I'm still very much aware, hopefully, of how I sound or what words I'm choosing or how I feel about them. You know, and, and, a, and a chatbot has no awareness. I hope everyone knows that. <laughs> so... But that kind of monologue is a, f a sort of a dialogue in a sense. It's an introspective experience, right? Um, and uh, so I, th I, th I thought that was, I thought that was fascinating. It made me think about going back to the experience I had recently. I was talking about where there's a local radio personality who is using artificial intelligence to make songs, political songs for a station, and. You know, musically, um, they're, they fall short. Um, you know, I think of AI as paint by numbers. That was something kind of an old timey thing when I was a kid. But, you know, if you wanted to learn to paint um, rather than actually learning to paint, learning to be an artist, whatever, you would, you would get this kit and it would sort of look like a, a map, like a jigsaw puzzle, and would have numbers on it. And the number ones would be red, and the number twos would be green, or whatever. And you know, you'd you'd fill in the requisite spots with the right color, and you'd end up with something that maybe looked like a tree or a teddy bear or whatever it was, you know. And it was fun to do, and it was kind of like I guess playing with Legos or something. But it has nothing to do with art, really. Um, it's certainly not. It's because, again, the 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 there's no co cohesion. There's there's no interplay between those parts. They're just they they're sort of all separate static little events that have nothing to do with one another really. And um, and it's the same thing. I think it's true with AI. It's kind of like a, a paint by numbers, a glorified paint by numbers. And I don't know if you, any of you guys have really tried to use AI. Boy, does it. Is it nutty and does it like to lie? I think basically AI does two things very, very well. A, it kisses your butt. And B, it lies like there's no tomorrow. And it will never admit to lying, ever, <laughs> ever. Uh, and big surprise because... Uh, Guess, guess who programmed the thing, right? So it's kind of like a direct reflection of the people who programmed it. Um, anyway, 
So this radio personnel is using AI to make these odd songs of um, for political reasons, for liberal politics. I think it's peculiar that they're using um, country western themes because <laughs> I don't think typically think of country western music as something that liberals like to listen to. Sometimes they'll try to use reggae, but the reggae sounds very sterile, um, uh, or the rap. It's it's all it's all very kind of stilted and you know. Um, but I will I will say this: um, what is happening is that. It, it ha in this instance, has been happening for centuries in music. And this is, and I'll, I'll get into this. So I, I kind of became interested a little bit in revolutionary American music, particularly revolutionary war music, Civil War music. But there's a tune that everyone's familiar with, Yankee Doodle. <whistles> Yankee Doodle went to town, right? Um, that tune that we all kind of know, uh, which was a used in the Revolutionary War in various ways, had its origins actually probably in Scotland, um, I think in the 1400s. And it was a, a, a tune called All the Way to Galway. And I actually was in Galway many years ago. Um, and I did go all the way to Galway. Um, but the, the uh, and that tune, if you listen to it on YouTube, by the way, is a fascinating tune. It's very unusual because the tune starts in a minor key unlike Yankee Doodle, which is in a major key. And then it modulates from a minor to a major, but in an unusual way, it goes up a fifth. It, it kind of perseverates on the dominant. Typically, when a tune modulates from a minor to a major key, it goes to its relative. So typically, it's up or down a minor third. So if it starts in D minor, usually it goes to F major. In this instance, it started, say, in D minor, went to A. So that was kind of interesting, but the middle of all the way to Galway, you will definitely hear da 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 and you'll you'll recognize the tune. Uh, so that tune, like many tunes in the world, and certainly in American music, was eventually became Yankee Doodle, and Yankee Doodle although we think of it as a patriotic song, it was actually a, a pejorative. It was actually a song that the British used to make fun of Americans. And the words, y Yankee, Yank, is uh, probably a pejorative term for a uh, colonist, an American, from a British perspective. And uh, a doodle dandy was considered someone who liked to dress... Uh, very in a very fancy manner, not not a masculine way, more of an effeminate way, but someone who was actually kind of androgynous, and you know, uh, Yankee Doodle Dandy uh, stuck a feather in his cap and called it macaroni. Macaroni was a wig, a kind of fancy wig that people would would wear. So they were accusing, eventually accusing the colonists of several things. One, of, of the men not really being real men, you know. Although this was kind of the first allusion to uh, LGBTQ, perhaps, you know, was some kind of, um, I mean, they, they were very aware of sexuality, right? Um, and clothes and, and, and makeup and wigs and all of these things. Uh, the other thing they were saying, though, is that the people who were the, the, the doodle dandies, they were dressing in ways um, that made them uh, seem as if they were uh, royalty or they were they were they were they were not staying within their station of a commoner of a, you know and so they they were accusing them of of uh, you know being above their station, you know, which, and of course, right, the American Revolution was all about getting out from under uh, the, the control of a king, right, and, and having a more egalitarian society. So that tune eventually got turned around. There were many different iterations of lyrics that were written for that tune. And then um, eventually the Americans started singing it uh, as a way to taunt the British. 
so it got that got that got, kind of got turned around again. Um, so much so actually that there was an instance um, where there was a there was a British defeat. That the, so the, the so the 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 uh, French were involved in the American Revolution, and there was a, a battle, and the, the, the British had, I guess, had surrendered, and the French had fought alongside the Americans, and the British were not willing to at least acknowledge their defeat by the Americans. They wouldn't look at the Americans, only the French soldiers, and so Lafayette was so angry about that that he told the French band to play Yankee Doodle, at which time the British realized that, yes, the Americans had defeated them. So. Here's here's a kind of a metamorphosis of a tune, almost like you know a a, a evolution, right? Uh, um, uh, same thing with with the Star Spangled Banner. The Star Spangled Banner was um, came from a popular tune, an Acreon in Heaven, and it was a drinking song, it was an English drinking song. But I think that what's happening now with the chatbots and people using these tools, these software devices to make music, um, I think they're doing something very similar in a sense. They're getting these machines to take a song that, say, formerly would uh, have been a conservative song, and now they're making it into a liberal song. And I think that's kind of interesting. So I'm not really focusing on whether or not it's great music. I think that's less important. I think what is important is how human beings use music and the evolution that happens to a piece of music um, and how these tunes kind of uh, keep their place in a society is this this folk music um, and it it, it 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 turns up in various forms you know that's really the story of music in general I mean every great piece of music that we've ever heard has come from some kind of folk tune more or less and of course if the tune's good enough, then it'll be stolen many, many times. And so it might start out with with Bach, and then it goes to Beethoven, and then it goes to Brahms. And um, that was there was that. By the way, that was a theme f uh, from from the original Star Trek. And I forget what the story was precisely. There, if you search YouTube, you'll find some kind of very interesting video about the um, genesis of the Star Trek theme because it actually came from a symphonic work. I think I think it originally came from a Beethoven work and then it went on, I believe, to Mahler and then it went from Mahler to Brahms. Um, so same, same idea. Um, but the idea that music to be music needs to have some kind of immediacy and spontaneity and something that isn't particularly always predictable again like kind of like watching a basketball game you know you know you know the basic rules you know that there are certain boundaries and yet we watch the game over and over again because each one's different each one comes out kind of different that doesn't happen in the world of electronics it also doesn't happen by the way in a recording Right, it really, it really doesn't. Um, even if it's, if it's a good recording by real musicians, it's that it doesn't happen in recording. That's why I would even go one step further and say that music isn't music unless you're really hearing it live, unless you're experiencing it live in some way. Um, and this whole idea of capturing an event, like I'm doing now, I'm capturing this event, but um, it's it's a bit, it's a bit. I think maybe maybe the uh, the uh, practitioners of voodoo in Haiti you know they believe that when you take your when you take a picture of them you're stealing their soul maybe there's something to that you know there's there you are kind of stealing their soul in a way you know and I mean whatever that is you know when whatever a soul is but um, it's it's making the thing more important than the actual person right I, and and um, I can't think of a greater sin than that. You, you know, you have a, um, you have a society that places greater value on this is nothing new, but you know, material objects as opposed to actual living, breathing human beings. Um, and it's and conversely, that oddly enough, my feeling is that throughout history, human beings have always wanted to be machines in some strange way. And then uh, even 
you know, there's the admonishment of uh, Icarus, I guess, with the wings of wax flying too close to the sun, you know, and, and wings melt. Um, this, you know, human beings kind of always want to go beyond their their limitations, right? And they we so have airplanes and you know whatnot, but. Um, there's always there's a, there's always a downside, right? There's always you know that the technology gives with one hand and takes with the other in a sense. So um, I, again, what am I, what's my point in rambling on about this? Well, I, my point is that um, what we what we what we think is music, you know how 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 do we know we're making music? I mean that's the real question. You know, great musicians spend their whole lives asking that question and taking their works to friends and you know is this good enough is this is make does this make sense because it's all kind of a mystery to us i mean anyone who thinks they they really have have it nailed down i mean you know i i don't think so you know we're all we're all kind of struggling and trying to figure things out um but this this whole idea of improvisation in language being analogous to music as a language, and the whole idea of immediacy, and the whole idea also of through improvisation. Um, improvisation, in a sense, is a negotiation in real time. You know, it's a negotiation of a sort. Uh, you know, when you're when you're playing with someone else, and you're, you know, you're maybe getting louder, and are they going to get louder with you or not? Are they going to insist that they, it stays soft, or if you make you know, playing some chords that become more complex. Are they going to go along with you or not? Or if you're accompanying someone else, are you going to go along with them? And, you know, to what extent? I mean, it's, there's, there's, this, there's this dialogue that, that, that goes on that's required. And, of course, the, the other element, a very important element, is the audience, right? The audience has to be there to experience it. To experience it. It's like if a tree falls in the forest and there's no one around to hear it, does it make a sound? And the answer is no. It doesn't make, because there's no one around. It needs to be perceived to be a sound. Um, and it can't be a sound just in and of itself. Um, at least that's what our, the egocentric human beings think. Um, but we need, we need audiences, and it's very hard to improvise music to an audience or with an audience that doesn't know any music, right? The audience has to know something as well, right? They have to come to the table with something. And conversely, there are audiences that insist on buying a ticket to a live concert so that they can ostensibly hear a recording. That And well, there are a lot of live performances that actually play recordings and you'll be treated to maybe a light show and dancing, but you know you're listening to a recording, so you kind of have to wonder: Well, why, why would why would anyone want to pay good money to go to a live performance to hear a recording? I remember, you know, playing in a lot of cover bands growing up, and and um, I remember my 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 mother hearing some of these bands and their friends, and they, they always we'd always wonder like, why do you want to copy these bands so you sound exactly like them? They couldn't quite understand that like well uh for one thing we were kids and uh we didn't have our own personalities and we liked the the, the band that we heard and so we wanted to sound like them you know uh, until such time as we had our own personalities so that it kind of helps you develop a bit right as long as you can discard it right but there there are people that don't that can't discard that um persona that they take on and in the extreme right it kind of becomes a cult right it becomes you know where you're you are defined by s someone else um i don't know if anyone in the audience would rec uh, recognize the name Artie shaw so Artie shaw one of the great uh legends of jazz clarinetist like benny goodman um, and in his day he was a real rock star and he quit he quit at the height of his career. And why did he quit at the height of his career? Because he got tired of going to the gig and being expected to play the same way all the time. You know, And I would encourage anyone who is not familiar with Artie Shaw to listen to his music. And floating around out there, there is a series of 
interviews with him. Um, I heard them on cable, uh, not, I mean, many years ago, but he was such an interesting, intelligent man. Uh, and I, one of the stories that he related, I remember, was that he, he had, many years later, he had, he had of course, he retired, gone to, went to a concert, and uh, he met a music critic. And the music critic went up to him and, and he said, you know, uh, Mr. Shaw, I'm really surprised to see you here. I didn't think you liked this kind of music. And Artie Shaw got kind of angry and he said, I'm not here because I like the music. I'm here to see if the musicians know what they're doing. So he was open-minded. He wanted, he, he went to concerts not for confirmation of his own biases or, or to just simply be entertained or distracted. He genuinely wanted to experience and understand music from another musician's perspective. And hopefully the musicians um, were talented enough and educated enough where they would enlighten him in some way. I mean, this is someone who's searching his whole life to experience music in, in a new way. And that's what I tell people that that you know ultimately my definition of jazz is an open-mindedness very simply it's an open-mindedness um, yes you can define jazz in terms of styles and periods and recordings and certain artists but ultimately if you look at what jazz does you have say one song one standard okay and it's played by a hundred different people with a hundred different interpretations. And unlike a piece of classical music, which is much more rigid in, in terms of what notes you're going to play, um, these arrangements, there's a wide latitude in which you could go and how you arrange it and how you stylize it and what tempo you choose and all of those things and what instrumentation. So that's typically not something that's done in classical music. Now, why isn't it done in classical music? Well, A, it, um, it's not necessary. I mean. We're, I'm not Bach. I'm not as smart as Bach is, okay? So anything that I do to a piece of Bach, you know, other than what Bach wants me to do is probably not going to be as good. It's just not going to be, you know? So why don't I just do what he, he, he tells me to do and try to figure out as a, the best way to get that across, okay? And yes, if you have enough experience with music, there are very good reasons to uh, Im genuinely improvise. And of course, there was a tradition of improvisation in classical music. There was um, the cadenza in concertos, where uh, like like a you know like a piano concerto. So the the cadenza would be the the moment at which the musician would improvise. Now Mozart would do actual improvisations. Um, most people aren't going to do that, <laughs> so he wrote out the cadenzas so people could could play them. You know. Um, and again, you know, why would you want to do that? Well, just to get a, a, a fresh perspective, you know, taking a simple idea, practically speaking, if you're if you're practicing a piece of music, taking a, a, sim a simple idea and trying to approach it in more than one way. So let's just pick a number and just say three different ways. If you can do something, three to play a chord three different ways, play a scale three different ways, three different kinds of fingerings, three different kinds of dynamics, three different kinds of phrasing, all of which will co convey the music in a different manner. Now, here's what I don't understand a after teaching music for many years. Um, I genuinely don't believe that people are interested in improvising. And I don't believe they're interested in spontaneity. Um, and I'm not exactly sure why. I know it's necessary for living. We all improvise all day long. If you didn't, you'd die. You know, if you didn't improvise crossing the street, uh, you die because part of the improvisation is looking both ways when you cross the street. Now, a lot of people these days <laughs> come to think of it, um, more so than not, people don't look at all, actually, now that, I, now that I come to think of it, and you know what I'm talking about, but they will just plow through uh, a crosswalk. They don't care about the lights. They have their headphones on. They're looking at their phone. Um, and there have been a lot of close calls like that, you know, and probably needless injuries and deaths because people are so heavily focused in their in their own world. Um, that's a whole nother 
tangent. And when I grew up, and I'm sounding like an old man, but you know, when I grew up, um, we kind of did one thing at a time. Like if we ate pizza, we ate pizza. We didn't eat pizza and look at our phones or eat pizza, look at our phones and talk on the phone or eat pizza and look on the phone and I don't know, uh, have your sneakers light up or whatever. I mean, we did one thing and you didn't have a proliferation of music coming out of every orifice and every, you know, doorway and window and crevice, you know, and, and it's until it's like just a tyranny, you know, you have all recorded music and, you know, constantly it just, just wasn't around. You, if you wanted to listen to music, you sat down and you put your record on, you listened to music or you just, it was an activity. It was a singular activity. Um, as a musician, you know, I mean, oddly enough, I'm not an advocate of background music. I don't think music should be in the background. It just it's, doesn't make any sense to me at all. Yeah, there's always exceptions, so, you know, but um, it's, you know, you, you're, you're probably better off just not listening to it. Um, in fact, there's a restaurant I, 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 I go to regularly to eat at. It's a great restaurant. They play jazz, but it's not really appropriate because um, recorded jazz, kind of more traditional bebop jazz, but you can't really hear anything because there's such a clatter in the restaurant. There's such a cacophony. Um, it's just not appropriate, you know. And the, the person I go with, they, they say to me, well, I don't like that music. And I, I say, well, look, you know, you're really not listening to it in an appropriate environment. You know, if you had listened to it in an appropriate environment where it was quiet and not this clatter of glasses and noise and echoes, and you know, you might actually enjoy it, but you're not really getting the right perception of it. So, um, I don't know. Today, I just kind of wandered around. Um, I'm gonna, yeah, there we go. But those are... Those are my thoughts, and I really do enjoy using this microphone. It, I feel, I feel like one of those talk show hosts from the '70s, you know, that that had their their microphone. I don't. Does anyone use a mic like this anymore? Well, anyway, this is Jonathan at the piano lesson. Uh, pleasure as always. Please uh, drop me a line and uh, let me know how you're doing. Um, and until until next time, um, we'll we'll we'll. We'll see you next week. Okay. Oh, one more thing. Notice the new hat? I don't know. You could let me know how you how you like the new hat. It's a it's a kind of a placeholder for the moment. So alrighty. See you later. <laughs>